So uh, welcome everybody to the New Simulization Project NSP's uh, live broadcast uh, with uh, uh, author and scholar um, Stephen Hulgate. Um, Dr. Hulgate is a Hegel scholar um, who many of us have read and are really excited and honored to have with us today, joining all the way from the UK. And so um, we'll be talking about Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, specifically the preface, um, but probably just his project in general and also, uh, I don't know, this is fitting because many of us just finished reading this, um, this book over the summer together. Um, many of us together, Dawson did it on his own and then joined us for the last conversation of, of, the, of the reading uh, and was able to join for that. That was really exciting. Um, uh, Tyler, who's with us right now, um, his, his is the one with the, uh, with the, the, the picture of the two people out, sitting out in nature. Um, right. Tyler, Tyler studied German idealism at uh, University of New Mexico. And, uh, well, I guess I'll let him do a little introduction on what he's been doing since then. But for now, I'll just say that it was Tyler who kind of, uh, was able to help us a lot through that process, um, because this was a, a terrifying, terrifying, uh, thing to approach, you know, um, right up there with being in time or, or difference in repetition or any of these other kinds of texts that I personally would never be able to really approach on my own, or maybe I could, and I'm selling myself short, but I, I do, I'm a big fan of, of, of these kinds of things with friends. And so NSP, the New Civilization Project, I'll just say a thing about that really quick, is um, a philosophy and critical theory um, organization based out of Boise State University. And um, we facilitate and organize discourses that try to be non-reactionary or capitalist realist. And that generally falls in a leftist terrain um, a, a critical theory terrain that is very much informed by authors such as Hegel, Heidegger, Husserl, Zizek, as we were just talking about off camera, and the like. And so um, everybody working within that milieu is always referencing back to Hegel. Um, but one of, the, one of the big questions that we are exploring is how to live a good life. What is a good life? What, it, what, is, what is it about our times? that are fundamentally different than any other times we have ever lived in? And what do these kinds of texts show us about the changing conditions and possible um, openings or lines of flight into living differently? Um, uh, plugs about future events, I will only say that we're being joined by Peter Fraze, the author of Four Futures, um, next month. You can look at our Facebook events for that. And we are doing a conference for responding to Jordan Peterson um, October 19th through the 21st, where we will be joined by uh, the world famous Marxist economist Richard Wolff, um, the radical theologian Peter Rollins, um, and the podcast Zero Squared, which is out of Zero Books Publishing, and then uh, the, uh, uh, Michael Brooks from the Majority Report, and he, has, he also has his own show called The Michael Brooks Show. Um, we're really excited for that opportunity and we'll be joined by many academics um, from all over the country who will be presenting or just attending. And so it's going to be an exciting opportunity. But I'm done making plugs. Um, really, I just want to give it up to uh, St uh, Dr. Stephen Hulgate and please, yeah, please welcome him. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Oh, you've got Tyler on mute. Could you unmute him? Oh, Tyler, you can unmute yourself. Oh, no, right? it's, just, it's just when they're not speaking. So. Oh, okay. What happened? Oh, he, he, Tyler's. Tyler. Yes, uh, I just muted myself because oh, I uh, have the Senate hearings on in the background. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, oh, okay. Senate okay, perfect. Okay, Dr. Hulgate, welcome. Good. Although I am, this is well, it's a great pleasure to be with you all and to uh, to meet you all. Um, I assume that the format of this would be that um, you're going to uh, put forward various questions, reviews, comments, um, rather than my just sort of starting to talk. I mean, obviously, I could, if you want to kick the ball, I mean, I could tell you a bit about. How I got into Hegel and so on, but I felt this was an opportunity really for you to 
uh, to explore things that have been um, concerning you over the summer. Um, I have to say, first of all, I'm extraordinarily impressed. Did you get through the whole of the phenomenology in one summer? Yes, yes. Okay, that is quite a that's 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 faster than I would be able to do it. I can tell you. Um, I was a, a student in I don't know when I first read the phenomenology, but I I worked on the logic as a student in the 1970s in Germany, and uh, it took a whole year and a half to do mm. to do the logic. Um, anyway, that's by the way. So I'm I'm extremely impressed and and also um thrilled that uh, that hegel represents such an important figure for you um so i'm uh, really at your disposal how would you like to proceed do you want to start off or do you want me to say some things well i have first of all you recommended a, a book about derrida by rudolfo gassich i'm not quite sure how oh, you... Gasse. that's right yes and um about reflection, because reflection is the way it's used in Hegel has been um, confusing to me, and uh, part of me thinks that uh, well, reflection is not quite as real. It's like you use reflection to get to the concept, you use reflection to get to the absolute, and. Uh, and I, and I find discussions of reflection, the mirror of the mirror and the bending, mm -hmm. um, I have a real hard time with that part. And I was wondering if you could maybe uh, expand on, on the importance of the concept of reflection in Hegel. Uh, sure. Um, well, obviously it has a, a history that, um, that goes back before Hegel, I suppose um, probably the best place to start would be with Kant. Um, Kant, as you will know, distinguishes between um, sort of base level categories that are the conditions of objects of experience. But then there's another set of concepts he calls concepts of reflection, uh, and he discusses those in the Amphiboly chapter of the first critique. They include concepts like identity and difference, matter and form, um, and they aren't, as it were, ground level concepts that constitute objects of experience, but rather concepts that guide the thinking that, um, uh, that we do with respect to those uh, um, uh, objects of experience. And then, of course, in the third critique, again, uh, um, reflective judgment is picked up. Now, this is not about Kant, so I don't want to get into Kant too much, but that just is meant to indicate that one meaning of reflection for Hegel is that it's an activity of thought that we engage in um, about the things that there are. And if you take reflection to be that, sort of early, uh, a sort of early Hegelian view, then Hegel's concern that that shifts the focus too much, if you like, onto the thinker, onto subjectivity, and we move away from concern with objects, with, with things, with being itself. Um, there are other critics of reflection. I mean, Hölderlin is one, Schelling is one. So early Hegel is sort of part of a, of a criticism of the philosophy of reflection, which wants partly to sort of reorient philosophy more towards, um, I suppose, the unity of being. Um, Hölderlin's short essay on judgment and being would be a good example of that, which understands the unity of being as being sort of fundamental and primordial and reflection or judgment as a kind of um, uh, not exactly epi, epi phenomenon, but it sort of rides on top of that. Um, OK, so that's one aspect of reflection, that, that it represents uh, the thinking that we do about things in an ordinary sense of reflecting on something. Another meaning of reflection um, which is somewhat tied to that, is that it's a kind of thinking that divides, you know, finite from infinite, subject from object, form from content. Um, now, that aspect of reflection gets uh, a different name later in, in, uh, in Hegel's thought, and it really gets called the understanding. So it seems to me that understanding as a way of thinking, which divides various concepts from one another really takes opposites at face value. The finite is the finite and not the infinite, and the infinite is the infinite and not the finite, and so on. 
that is what sort of reflection sort of morphs into as Hegel becomes the mature Hegel. Again, Hegel is very critical of, uh, of this. Um, and um, he sees a connection between the two conceptions of reflection, really. That the reflection that understands itself to be a subjective act reflecting on objects is setting itself over against those objects and not seeing thought and reason as somehow being constitutive of them. So there is a sort of a, you know, there's a, there's a, a connection between the two ideas. Um, right, now, there's an, another notion of reflection, though, which I think is perhaps what you're getting at. And that comes up in the logic of essence, uh, in Hegel's logic. And this is what gets us close, in a way, to some of the things that Derrida is interested in. And this is really an ontological structure. So when Hegel talks about reflection in the logic, I think, although someone like Robert Pippin doesn't think, so you need to know there are alternative ways of looking at this, that Hegel means by reflection an ontological structure. It's, it's, it's a way of being. Um, the way of being that it is um, operates through negation and double negation. So essence is quite a difficult bit of the logic because the categories, in a sense, don't seem to have any positive substance to them. You know, in, 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 in um, uh, the logic of being, you have something which is positive and you have another. Or you have uh, the one and the many. You have sort of positive, even in quantity, you have quantity and quality. You have sort of positive poles. But in essence, you don't have that. You have what Hegel will refer to as a play of seeming, shine, where you have not being sort of reflecting itself into more not being. And that play of reflection um, both constitutes certain determinacies, but also effaces them. I suppose what uh, connects this with Derrida a little bit is the idea that, um, that double negation negates its own negative status. It kind of effaces the fact that it's negative. Um, and you can see, you can connect that to Derridean ideas of the trace, for example, traces that, 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 that both sort of ground, but sort of efface what it is that they establish. Um, and there are structures not a million miles away from this in Deleuze as well, actually. Now, that reflection is a little harder to connect with the other notion of reflection I was talking about before. So I suppose it depends which reflection you want to talk about. Um, how does this appear in, in the phenomenology? I think it appears in the phenomenology in the notion of negativity. Um, uh, negativity, you know, there's a technical difference for Hegel between negation, which is simple, this, uh, this not that, and negativity, which is double negation, which is the negation that negates itself. Right. Now that can have a positive beginning. So you have something positive, it's negated, you negate that negation and you, you know, something new arises. But it can also have a negative beginning. And what happens in the logic of essence is it has a negative beginning. So you start with the idea that being as, as it were, um, I would say, well, yeah, maybe vanished into non-being, but that non-being negates itself and in recoiling back on itself, starts constituting structures which then arise. So I'm not sure how much of that was intelligible, but that's what reflection is. Hegel thinks in its ontological sense, it's a real moment. So take something like shine. I mean, you're, you, uh, um, one of you there's working on the aesthetics. The aesthetics would be unintelligible without the notion of shine. Shine for Hegel, is defined by non-being, it's seeming. It seems to be, but it isn't. And it's very non-being is, it's seeming, you know, you look at the mirage and it's there, but of course it isn't there. It's there in not being there. Um, now take that moment of non-being and shine and push it even further so it kind of recoils back on itself and you get reflection. And <clears throat> Hegel thinks um, that this idea, what, what then emerges in the logic of essence are categories that are constituted through not being what they're not. If I can just intervene and say a little bit about Deleuze here, De, in Deleuze's book on Nietzsche, Deleuze sets up an, op an opposition between a kind of an affirmative mode, and this is Nietzsche saying there's an affirmative way of being that says yes to, to, to life, and through saying yes to life sort of negates other things. And there's a negative there's a negative uh, form of will to power, which starts with the negative 
and then constructs positivity out of the negation of the negative. Deleuze thinks that's Hegel. It isn't, but it is essence as Hegel conceived it. That movement of double negation and Hegel thinks it's a moment of the truth and there are categories and phenomena in the world and phenomena and experience that are constructed as it were through bouncing back to themselves off their own negative so that's that's right but that's the middle bit of the logic not the whole of it so um and you know in nature i guess i mean light is his favorite example of reflection at work what does reflection look like out in the world i suppose light and the images that you get um, reflected off uh, objects. So now we can talk more about this. It's not really to do with the phenomenology directly. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how much of that was clear. But um, reflection is a difficult topic. Well, that helps clarify things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If no one else is going to say something, I guess I'll just jump in for a second just to say that I. Uh, um, I've been particularly uh, troubled by by picture thinking um, and and trying to and what I was just, I'm really curious to hear more about what he means by picture thinking. He it seems like it definitely is something that he wants to break out of um, mm -hmm. or or surpass somehow or get below. I don't know if you could help us uh, understand that a little better. Maybe. Okay, all right. Um, well, again, let's go back to Kant and let's think about the difference between intuition and concepts. Um, a difference which really um, is an, an updated version of a very old distinction between, if you like, the singular and the universal. So intuitions are, are always singular for Kant. They are intuitions of, of this or this or this. And concepts are more generic. Um, now, between the two, Kant places imagination. Um, imagination is that faculty of retaining what's no longer presence, uh, present. And, and of course, Kant, uh, as, as you know, thinks that some element of imagination is involved in all perception. Okay, now Hegel really takes over uh, uh, that same threefold distinction, intuition, what he calls Vorstellung, which is basically what's translated as picture thinking, and then concept. And uh, he also talks about language more than, uh, than Kant does. But nonetheless, he keeps that basic Kantian uh, uh, um, threefold division. Um, so what is picture thinking? Well, it's, pic it's thinking that operates with Vorstellung. Now, Vorstellung, Vorstellung is often translated as representation. It's probably better translated as presentation. Although, oddly enough, representation has an element of truth to it because it's a, a foreshadowing is not present in the way that an intuition is you know the books in front of you this computer here i can intuit them i see them i feel them i hear them they're there foreshadowing are always interiorized they're at one remove from being present so they're set before foreshadowing is just to set before they're set before the mind they have um and intuited, that's a sensuous, either content or form. And they represent a sort of a transitional stage between intuition and concepts. And Hegel thinks they are what most of us do most of our thinking with. I mean, we also exercise understanding, but we do a lot of our thinking in everyday life. Poetry works within the realm of Vorstellung, stroke imagination. Religion does. Um, our metaphors with which we sort of pepper our language, all that's Vorstellung. Um, okay, so I said they can have either sensuous, a sensuous form or content. A sensuous content is fairly easy to understand. I mean, in a way, just, you know, think of the tree outside your window, close your, uh, close your eyes and, and sort of picture it in your mind. That's already an example of Vorstellung. But, Hegel, but I think what's more interesting for philosophy for Hegel is the fact that Vorstellung can have a if you like a sensuous form. So what gives them their form? Well, the form of being individuated, the form of being, as it were, almost sort of separated off from something else. So Vorstellungen, Hegel says, are connected really by the word and. There's God and God's omniscience and God's omnipotence 
and eternity, and there are finite things, and there's creation. That is a typical way of um, thinking in terms of Forschung. I think it was Wittgenstein, but I may have got this wrong, who says it's a thinking that just talks of one bloody thing after another, basically. That's Forschung. So what does it lack compared to understanding and then speculative uh, 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 reason? Well, compared to understanding, it lacks necessity. It lacks the idea of necessary connection. So, so Vorstellung doesn't really have a strong sense of necessary interconnectedness. And compared to Hegel's you know, speculative thinking, he doesn't have a dialectical moment. Concepts don't turn into their opposites. They don't um, dynamically transform themselves. Um, so I suppose that's what picture thinking would be. Um, so an example of that, I mean, I suppose the easiest example to think of is the difference between philosophy and religion as Hegel conceives it. You know, Hegel thinks that uh, philosophy, uh, speculative philosophy and religion, principally Protestant Christianity, share the same content. They both tell the same story about the world. Philosophy says reason, the idea uh, becomes incarnate in nature and human beings and comes to self-consciousness, becomes spirit in and through human beings. Hegel thinks Christianity takes us, tells us the same story. It just talks about God creating a world, becoming incarnate and becoming, you know, resurrected as Holy Spirit. But Hegel thinks that the same content is being presented in two different forms. The form of philosophy is that of concepts. The form of religion is not exclusively, but largely to do with Vorstellung. And so, whereas philosophy will talk about the idea, religion will talk about God the Father. Whereas philosophy will talk about, uh, and, and I have to say, it's not the clearest bit of Hegel, but about the way in which the idea discloses itself to be nature, religion will talk about God the Father creating nature. Creation then being, as it were, a metaphor, an image for the process that, that philosophy describes. Um, and also religion tells the story of the idea becoming spirit as a story, as a narrative. Yeah. As a narrative that's both poetically structured and historically structured. So that all belongs to Vorstellung. Um, so I say, I would say that the, if you think of it in terms of Vorstellung and picture thinking operates with either internalized images drawn from sensuous experience or um, ideas drawn from thought, but given a sort of an isolated status. So they're connected through the and, or they're connected just in terms of this happens and then this happens and then this happens and then this happens. That's basically picture thinking. And Hegel's not trying to eliminate it. He's not trying to eliminate it. He just doesn't think it's appropriate for philosophy. But, I mean, and this is contentious, I guess, but my view is Hegel thinks that, you know, human beings cannot live by concepts alone. They need intuitions. They need imagination. They need bodily experience. They need lots of things to be, and they need to experience the truth through all of these. So that's why art and religion, for example, are crucial for Hegel. And, and so knowing the truth through picture thinking is important. It's just not what philosophy does. Although, of course, famously, Hegel has, and particularly in the preface to the phenomenal, a lot of very riveting and arresting uh, mm. pictures. Mm. So, I don't know, does that help a bit? Uh, yes. Yes. Are yes. still on mute? No, right. I, I was going to ask a follow-up question on, yeah. on just truth. Like, um, I mean, I've got a, a vague sense of it, but what is Hegel saying like about what is true? Um, I, I know that's a big open <laughs> question. That's true. But. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, uh, right. Well, um, he, he addresses this uh, um, uh, explicitly. And the first thing to say, of course, uh, and you, you will have read the preface to phenomenology and you know there what he says about the true and the false and, and, and trying to undermine that distinction. Um, the ordinary sense of truth, Hegel is not denying at all. That it is true that there's not an elephant sitting on your sofa there is beyond dispute. 
you know that's that those are so he's not denying truth in that sense um truth as correspondence of of sentences ideas propositions to the facts it, it's just that's not what he's very interested in um what he under understands by truth is um i suppose in we should distinguish between philosophy and phenomenology perhaps i think of hegel's philosophy as being uh, where Hegel tells us you know, what he thinks there is, whereas phenomenology is a study of what happens when you think of the world in a certain set of ways. So stick with philosophy for a minute. Mm. Um, truth, he defines as the correspondence between an object and its concept. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, the example he gives is think of like a true friend. Um, now, a true friend would be someone who fulfills the concept of being a friend. Now, you can make incorrect judgments about your true friend. The true friend will still be a true friend. You just make incorrect judgments about him or her. So there are already two different conceptions of truth there. Now, what that notion of truth, I think, is trying to get at is that there is an internal connection between what, um, let's say, something is intrinsically that's another way of thinking about its concept what is something intrinsically and what is it explicitly if the friend is a true friend then the friend is explicitly what it is implicitly to be a friend now it's possible of course to live and to be only at the level of implicitness not to fulfill what one is but it's also possible to fulfill what you are so truth it seems to me is in the particular case in the global case um, that process in which objects or being itself come to be explicitly what they are implicitly and it's an ontological process it's not just about propositions um it's and of course it's very close to aristotle i mean the one way of thinking about this is terms in terms of aristotle and things fulfilling their function i suppose you could you could say that aristotle's function sort of lives on in hegel's idea of the concept of something what it is intrinsically and just as for aristotle things have a certain function which they then fulfill better you know um, um for to a greater or lesser degree so that's true with hegel so um, now that means that truth is a structure it's a happening it, it's it's something that sort of happens within being being is truth insofar as it passes and moves from implicitness into explicitness it becomes fully explicit uh, not only in nature but in self-conscious beings like us there may be other such beings in the universe but but um, but he thinks self-consciousness uh, is just, as it were, being coming into its truth. So it's, an, it's a different notion of truth. I mean, um, uh, um, it's, it's, I think it's not un unintelligible, um, mm. but it's not the conception of truth that most epistemologists would worry about, for example, when they're trying to think. It has, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with... Um, um, uh, with the kind of beliefs we've got. I mean, whereas you think of, of, of you know, of, of knowledge is justified true belief, true is, is sort of appended then to belief. You have beliefs which are true or not true. That's not the way that Hegel thinks about truth. Do you think it might correlate with Heidegger when he says truth is relative to Dasein? Is that kind of a Hegelian influence statement? that Because it's revealed through epic, from epic to epic? truth is relative to Dasein, or is that just something more Heideggerian and not Hegelian? Um, well, I mean, there is something similar in that obviously Hegel, like Heidegger, has a historical conception of truth. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I have a PhD student who's working on, it's very interesting, it's, it, it's the project is to put together two thoughts. One thought is about how you understand true and false in relation to one another. 
And the other is how you think of philosophy in relation to history. Wow. And his argument is that for someone like Descartes, and I don't want to be down on Descartes, I love Descartes and teach Descartes and have very high regard for him, but nonetheless, in this respect, Descartes mm. thinks of truth and falsity as, as at odds with one another. And so once philosophy has come into its truth, then false ideas are set to one side. The um, corollary of that is that philosophy doesn't really have a history. Mm. I mean, sure, there were philosophers before Descartes, but the history of philosophy isn't integral to philosophy as Descartes conceives it. When you come to someone like Hegel, on the other hand, there isn't such a sharp distinction between true and false in philosophy. You rather get sort of partial disclosures, more or less partial disclosures of the truth. Um, and so philosophy itself has a history, namely the history of moving through partial disclosures of the truth to a progressively uh, fuller um, conception of the truth. Um, so you could say, if you look back, let's say you, you know, you're, you're Hegel looking back to Leibniz or looking back to Spinoza. Mm. Hegel's not going to say that either of those two is wrong. They're not wrong. They're both right about the part of truth that they're disclosing. And it was necessary yes. that that truth gets disclosed. So I suppose you could say there is a certain relative truth that's getting disclosed, but that's a moment of the truth with a capital T. And, and it has to become explicit, even if, it's, even if it's always already been the case that, uh -huh. that um, what Leibniz is highlighting was sort of implicit in the very structure of being, that needs to be brought out you know, by the Greek atomists and then by Leibniz, it needs to become explicit. So now, um, Heidegger, obviously there are parallels with Heidegger, but Heidegger doesn't want the story of truth to be a story of, of self-consciousness necessarily. He doesn't want to think of it as progressive in quite the way that Hegel does. Um, and so there are differences uh, there. And I would, I, and, I, and I think probably Hegel it, well, not as probably, I mean, definitely, Hegel is, is committed to the idea that the true structure of being can become fully explicit to itself in and through mm. human understanding. Now, Heidegger's never going to say that. No. Um, so there are, there are similarities, there are, there are differences. Um, you know, in many ways, Heidegger, from my point of view, although I, I the limit to what I will say about this, probably looks a little bit more like Schelling than, than Hegel on, on, on many occasions. Um, but yeah, so there are definite parallels. And clearly, in comparison to, let's say, someone like uh, Descartes, um, um, Hegel and Heidegger are, um, uh, you know, have, have, have something in common. And I think it's unlikely, but just in case Graham, my student, is watching, thank you. <laughs> for saying all of this because it's 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 not quite complete yet but it will be complete at some point and uh, and he's doing a really good job so thanks graham for that yeah i'm glad he's, he's doing that the uh the discussion of the true brings to mind and that it's process brings to mind the actual um what exists is not necessarily actual and um, I'm thinking of the nature of the state, say, in 1830 hmm. for Hegel. And, you know, Hegel has taken uh, a lot of uh, flack for uh, what is it, the real is actual and the actual is real. Hmm. Was, was the state at his time more actual? Uh, was it? more fully developed in terms of the concept than, say, the state in France during the terror. I know that he'll mm -hmm. see the terror of that time as like they were dealing with kind of an empty universal. Yep. Um, so um, could you maybe elaborate on yeah. those distinctions a little bit? Okay, well, you're absolutely right that, uh, that Hegel doesn't equate actuality with existence. I mean, he distinguishes them in the encyclopedia, and they're explicitly distinguished in, in, the, um, in the logic. Uh, so just to keep things simple, let's just think of existence as stuff that's there. 
it just it sort of is it happens um and it includes all manner of things some of which are necessary some of which are contingent uh, uh one of hegel's um uh, one of the examples i like is from the logic um where hegel says you know there's no deep philosophical reason why there should be 60 species of parrot in the world i mean this is you know, he, you know, this is one of the few funny bits in the logic um okay so actuality wirklichkeit if you think of it now we we lose that in the english think of wirklichkeit wirklichkeit comes from wirken wirken is to effect something to to sort of to make it happen to bring it about so actuality is um that dimension of what there is that is creative and and constructive and and makes things happen and hegel wants to argue that ultimately when one takes the sort of philosophical view although not necessarily in every detail it's reason that makes things happen it's reason and this is what he's trying to show in the philosophy of nature it's reason that explains why um there is space time matter light why there are differences between physical chemical organic uh beings uh, and so on and 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 that is a reason shot through with unreason because nature is a space in which reason and unreason sort of you know work together but also in tension with one another and more important history for us so hegel thinks also that history which by the way isn't everything that happens <laughs> It's, it's, it's that set of events which is precisely, from Hegel's point of view, evidently the work of reason. Um, so Hegel thinks that in history, or that which he counts as history, is the work of reason, ultimately. Um, that's to, not to say that it doesn't involve violence and, and, and slippages back and all manner of contingencies. But he thinks ultimately it leads to um, a deepening understanding of what freedom is and famously if you've read the philosophy of history he says you know it's 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 a, a simplification but it, it gets the point that he wants to get across that in oriental cultures he says you know one is free think of Xi Jinping um, in in classical cultures some are free so they have slavery and in modern Christian post-Christian culture implicitly if not always explicitly everyone's free uh, and then that works itself out into modern notions of of, uh, of universal right and so on, which get expressed in the French Revolution, for example. Um, so he thinks that there is a deepening understanding uh, of freedom, which is not just a matter of contingency, but is itself the work of reason. And he thinks also that that understanding brings with it uh, social, political and economic structures that more or less realize the changing perceptions of freedom. And so this gets us to the state. So uh, in Hegel's philosophy of right, he sets out what he takes to be the structure of freedom that is what made necessary by reason. And so it has a kind of, it has a, I think it has a normative structure. Um, Hegel, you know, famously says this philosophy doesn't just tell you what ought to be, um, but it doesn't just tell you what is either. Um, but there's a space between those two and, 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 um, if I just digress for a minute, if you, uh, I teach quite a lot of, I teach a lot of Spinoza and, and Leibniz and Descartes as well, and um, Spinoza and Descartes in particular draw a distinction that we don't really draw anymore. Um, so Descartes, for example, will say of a triangle that you know a triangle must have three sides and 180 degrees, um, even if there are no such things as triangles. So even if triangles don't exist. They must be like this. They are like this. It's not that they ought to be. They are like this. And Spinoza also will talk about the essence of something, what it is, even if it doesn't exist. And what it is isn't just what it ought to be. Plato has a similar idea it seems, when, you, when you think about the form of something. So if we can have that threefold distinction, there's simply what is, there's just what ought to be, and then there's what something is itself. Now, it seems to me that that's what the philosophy of rights meant to, mean to be uh, to set out. It's meant to set out what is the state, not what ought, not state ought to be. And it's not a description of the states that happen to be there. But what is the state conceptually? And it's interesting that, in fact, when you get to the philosophy of history, there is no historical state from Hegel's point of view that exactly matches that state. 
he takes I and mean, obviously it's meant to be a conceptually derived structure but when he's taking examples the jury system he takes from from britain but then he says the british don't have a properly developed sense of right so right is much better developed he thinks in france and in germany but then britain we have representative assemblies which were not there in uh, in in germany he also has praise for denmark for for the netherlands so really what he's doing is saying that modern states there isn't a single modern state that is actually the state the modern state although some are clearly more free than others you mentioned the french revolution yes one of the one of the main features that 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 uh, apart from the obvious um, culmination in death uh, that sets the french state apart from a, a constitutional state as hegel understands it is it doesn't have a clear separation of powers and hegel is you know he's he's not a democrat in any straightforward sense i think i think democracy is at best a moment within the state but what he's absolutely insistent upon is the importance of a separation of powers and what you get in the french revolution is a violation of that you first of all get the legislature taking over the executive in the first revolution and then the second revolution uh 1792 you get the committee for public safety taking over the national assembly and so you get the executive taking over the legislature, and Hegel thinks that plus you know the whole world of suspicion that uh, that the revolution generates that yeah that violates the idea of freedom. Um, so I would say now Germany. Well, Germany is difficult because obviously Hegel is thinking um, a lot about the reforms that were introduced uh, partly under Napoleon and partly in the wake of Napoleon. Um, at which point Prussia was becoming a much more rights-based and liberal sort of place. Uh, that suffered quite severe setback at the end of the 1810s, 1819. And then, of course, um, I, you know through the Carlsbad decrees that, that, that some of Hegel's own, own students were put under suspicion. And Hegel himself felt threatened. Um, so, and of course, the promised assemblies never materialized. So Germany doesn't, I mean, Germany in some respects has some of the aspects of a concrete modern state as Hegel conceives it, but it also lacks a lot of them. Um, so I think that's probably all I've got to say for the minute. I mean, we could talk a bit about the actual structure of the state if you wanted to, but... Um, um, I think, well, just maybe say one other thing, because I've actually been writing about this recently. Um, and I've been thinking about it a little bit with respect to uh, to, uh, to Brexit as well. Um, one of the things that uh, makes Hegel's conception of the state very distinctive, as I said before, he's not a Democrat. What I mean by that is that he doesn't put democracy at the heart of a free state. It's a moment within the state, and it's an absolutely vital moment. People need to be able to have a say through the representatives and they need to know and see that the laws that they live under are ones they can trust in and ones that actually secure their own benefit but what hegel thinks is much more important is that basic freedoms get enshrined in rights and so for hegel it's a bit of a slogan but i would say right trumps democracy now, right, of course, needs to be genuine right, not just privilege dressed up as right. It needs to articulate actual freedoms, among which Hegel counts, you know, the freedom of property, freedom of exchange, uh, the freedom of action, freedom of conscience, freedom to, to marry, to find your own job and occupation, and, and, and so on and so on. Um, um, and I think, just if I can throw this in, I know this is not perhaps relevant to the American context in such uh, a degree as it is to us, but one of the differences I find when thinking about the sort of British relation to the Europeans is that the Europeans are very comfortable, both in the German and the French tradition, with the notion of, of right and constitutional rights being enumerated and set out. Um, many British people find those rights to be burdens. You know, burdens that the state put upon us 
In fact, not even that the state, but Brussels puts them on. And, and, and I think in some ways we sort of almost look past one another when we have this debate, that what the Europeans think of as rights that protect workers from being exploited, for example. You know, there's a thing called the Working Time Directive, which came from the European Union, which, which makes it legal to require people to work more than a certain number of hours. Well, they think that's a genuine right because it protects workers. A lot of people in Britain think, oh, no, that's a you know, burden on industry, a burden on business. So mm -hmm. I think this different perspective um, that Hegel has is, is quite familiar to the Europeans. And it's not one perhaps that's so familiar or at least that we're so comfortable with in the Anglo-Saxon sphere. But perhaps America is a little bit more focused on rights than we are. I don't know. That's a different, a different debate. But um, Hegel himself thought that the British didn't have a very well-developed sense of right. And he thought that in the 1820s and 1830s. Mm. And I'm not sure that we've uh, improved greatly since then. Anyway, I don't know how much of that helps um, yes. with your question. But... Yeah, that's awesome. I have a couple other questions, but I don't want to be dominating. Things. <laughs> uh, Tyler, do you have uh, some questions or something? Or can yeah, yeah. Uh, I just had a quick uh, yeah, I just had a quick question about the way that you characterized nature earlier. Uh, you characterize nature as sort of a domain where reason and unreason and play out the particular events in the natural world. You referenced uh, the passage about there being no deep philosophical reason for there being sickness of parrot and mm -hmm. uh, the passages. And so I was just wondering, um, this implies a, about between the logic and, and the second volume, Clopedia. Um, in particular, I'm interested in your interpretation of transition uh, from logic to nature, because Hegel is uh, very scant on detail about mm -hmm. um, maybe how such a transition occurs. And the science logic, he seems to suggest something along the lines of like, oh, well, if you've understood uh, getting up to this point, then you understand why there doesn't need to be any sort of transition into the philosophy of nature or something like that. Um, and so I was just wondering, based on your characterization of um, nature as a space of reason and unreason, how is it that uh, what you're describing is unreason or maybe contingency or something like that uh, enters into the world and how do we move in Hegel's system from an analysis of the necessary structures of rationalization to this apparently contingent empirical stuff? Good question. <laughs> how long you got? Um, <laughs> um, okay, uh, let's just think a bit about the transition, um, uh, which is not a transition, as you say. Um, uh, in the, Towards the end of the um, uh, the encyclopedia logic, as I recall, Hegel distinguishes um, uh, sort of different um, different structures that you find within being, essence, and, and concept. And and just to keep it sort of very simple, um, within being, what you find is transition proper. Something becomes another. A finite becomes infinite. So you get a passing, an übergang, a passing over from one thing to another. In essence, you get what he calls this scheinen in anderes, which is a seeming, a, a sort of a seeming in the other. And so an example of that would be, think of the relation between cause and effect. They're not different concepts in the way that something and other would be, because the cause is already purely by itself the causing of the effect. And the effect is itself, purely by itself, the effect of a cause. So each one, as it were, appears in the other. What you then get with concept is a process of development. So universal, particular, and singular aren't one thing, another thing, and another thing. And they don't just 
sort of seem or shine in one another either. What happens is, the, is that the universal particularizes and singularizes itself. So the universal is the process of self-particularization and self-singularization. All right, so there we got three models. So the question is, does any of those fit the relation of logic to nature? Well, let's try the first one. Could it be that logic passes over into nature? Well, then nature would have to be something other than logic. But Hegel doesn't say that. He doesn't say ever, as far as I know, that nature is the other of reason or the idea. He says nature is the idea in its otherness. And they're different. So I would say the first idea of transition doesn't work. And so there isn't a transition from logic to nature in the sense in which you get them in um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the logic of being. Um, just to keep things short, I don't think logic of essence works either. So then you've really got concept. I mean, can we really talk of um, uh, the idea developing into nature? Well, maybe that's closer, but the problem with that is that that notion of development does, um, in a sense, really allow for um, stages in that development, and that itself is going to allow for a, a, a moment in which logic is prior to nature. And for reasons I'll explain in a minute, I think that's problematic. So what does Hegel actually say? Well, I mean, it's obscure, but he does use this, uh, this verb, sich entschließen, which is sometimes, it, I mean, it, 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 in everyday German, it means to decide, but it also means to disclose oneself as. And I guess, I think that's what's going on. I think that what happens at the end of the logic is the logic doesn't, reason doesn't pass over into nature. It discloses itself to be nature, to be in the form of its own otherness. So that means that nature is reason. Nature is the idea, but in the form of otherness. And it's that moment of otherness that brings in unreason. Contingency. A whole space in nature of externality. And this is interesting, of course, because this is a lot of this is prefigured within the logic. Um, think of, you know, externality in external reflection in essence or uh, the inner and the outer um, all through the logic you have structures where what is implicit or inner sort of outs itself externalizes itself and i think that's perhaps what's going on in the move to nature so nature is the externality of reason itself and then what you get, okay, so how does he structure the philosophy of nature? Well, basically, I suppose you start with space in which you have pretty much pure externality, where the structure of the idea, the sort of integrated um, unity of different moments that mark the idea at the end of the logic is pretty much lost. You just have here and here and here. You have a continuity, but you have sheer externality. And, and as you move through the philosophy of nature, then um, moments of unity and, and integration become more and more explicit and then that culminates in the organism and Hegel thinks that the organism is within the space of nature the, the point at which the um, integrated unity that characterized the idea sort of manifests itself again um, so okay so that's my broad take on on nature I mean I guess I think first of all Hegel's not trying to provide an alternative to natural science. He's trying to give a philosophical account of nature uh, with a particular view to um, showing the extent to which different aspects of nature more or less explicitly embody the idea, more or less explicitly embody unity. So, um, and what follows from that? A number of things. I think a certain anti-reductivism. I think it's one of the few things that Hegel has in common with Schopenhauer that they both are very hostile to the idea of reductivism. So sure, we can think of life as being made up of chemicals. I mean, there isn't for Hegel any élan vital. You know, that doesn't exist. On the other hand, life is not just chemical activity. It's chemicals that organize themselves in such a way that they can reproduce themselves and, and respond in ways that pure chemicals can't do. 
Similarly, um, chemicals themselves will have a, a physical dimension to them, but they're not just interacting in a physical way. And, and similarly, you can't just understand any of these in terms of mechanical interaction. So I think Hegel is wanting to suggest, yes, a continuity in nature, but a continuity of different forms of natural interaction and natural development. Um, and this is really, now this gets us into the phenomenology a little bit. Um, I don't know if you've ever sort of asked, the, 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 the bit that's, that I've got in mind here is, is force and understanding. Oh. Uh, without going through, because obviously that's a very difficult section. But what's interesting is that you begin with, with force, the play of forces. By the time you've got to the end, you've got this structure he calls infinity. Um, which he also equates with life. And infinity is this process whereby opposites pass into one another and constitute a unity in so doing. So the question is, what's the difference between that and the play of forces? Well, the play of forces require mutual solicitation. There's a certain sort of exteriority that forces have in relation to one another, even though they are bound and they're intrinsically relational. Each force only is, as it were, as the soliciting of and being solicited by another. Nonetheless, they don't come together in a single self-relating unity. But life is, for Hegel, a self-relating unity of its moments. Okay? For Hegel, then, you can't get life out of force. Okay? So what's, what relevance is that for someone like Nietzsche, for example, or Deleuze? Hegel would have to say, I'm sorry, there's a category mistake there. You can't reduce the living and the organic back to a dynamic structure of force. And I think this follows directly from the philosophy of nature, that, that, that we need to think of, um, of, of organic material, of chemical activity, of physical interaction and mechanical interaction as having a distinctive structure that's not reducible back although it's related to other structures and actually while i'm on this i think one of the things that i would want to highlight about hegel is the attention he gives to specific differences you know hegel in in the mind of certain mid-century 20 you know french philosophers hegel is all about totality and the whole and absorbing differences I really don't think that's true. I think what Hegel's about is trying to do justice to significant differences and, and not reduce things to one another. There's a, there's a fundamental anti-reductionism. Anti I mean, there's more one could say about the philosophy of nature, but um, that's probably enough for a minute. So I'm going to try and, this is related, ask a simple yes or no question. Um, is Hegel an idealist? <laughs> you think that's a simple yes or no question? <laughs> Just yes or no, you're not allowed to say anything. <laughs> we'll move right on. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yes, but. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I can do this fairly, uh, fairly simply, actually, it seems to me. Um, all right. If you mean by idealism something like Berkeley or Kant, where, you know, what Hegel calls subjective idealism, and obviously, no, he's not. I mean, I think to put it very simply, if all conscious being was wiped out of the universe tomorrow, would there still be planets and stars and galaxies? Well, yes, of course there would be. I mean, you know, what a dumb question in a sense. That's, that's so, no, he's not an idealist in that sense. Um, okay, so what does he mean by idealism? Well, I think you've got to look at the logic and you've got to think that idealism is the philosophy of the idea. So what is the idea? The idea is a logical structure. There are lots of logical structures. There's the structure of being, of quantity, of measure, of reflection, identity, concept, and idea. And what gives idea its specific character is that it is a unity of differences which are integrated into being moments of that unity. So the idea is not like an aggregate, you know, a whole lot of stuff you've got in your bag or a whole lot of billiard balls. That would be a mechanical aggregate. And it's not just a chemical interaction where you've got two different uh, elements, as it were, that are kind of 
different but also related to one another and attracted to one another it's a distinctive unity of moments so and hegel thinks yeah that he's an idealist and he thinks that 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 nature more or less embodies the idea as a structure human being more or less allowing for what we were saying before about historical development embodies the structure of the idea um and so idealism is not opposed to materialism matter organizes itself into living bodies living bodies for hegel are the material material expression of the idea so so i think that um and i don't think later materialist critics of hegel you know from feuerbach to marx really understand this i think what they think well they there's another sense in which he could be an idealist and i think this is this is actually perhaps closer to the truth is well, as i said before hegel thinks that the that reason is actual yes reason is actual now if you think that 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 reason is the only thing that does anything in hegel's world it's all just reason then okay you could call him an idealist of a different kind that you know he just believes the world is supremely controlled by by logos and that's all that issue um but as i've said in relation to nature that just isn't true because logic itself makes um unreason externality necessary but materiality is also the idea reason in its otherness so materiality is structured by reason so again there's no difference between materialism and idealism in that sense and also materialism gives itself the form of the idea organisms are the example of that Excellent. so, so I, uh, yeah uh, i mean there's two other things one could say but that'll do for the time being yeah i, I haven't read the logic but it's it's clear that i am missing out um could i mean i've read bits and have a bit of an idea about nature and that kind of stuff but i you know i've learned a ton just by listening you know it's clear that there's like a major gap in my understanding there but, well yeah. i mean you know it's understandable it's you know life is life is short there's a lot of things to be getting on with yeah. um but if i can uh, tell you a little bit about relation to obviously it's the phenomenology you've been studying um you might be wondering why i'm not why i'm not making more reference to the phenomenology and one answer to that is i guess is that i don't I, th I mean i think the phenomenology is a fantastic book a hugely important book and i think that phenomenology is an integral part of um the 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 system that hegel develops although i don't know that it's absolutely necessary for everybody but i don't think it's where hegel does philosophy um now i you know not everyone agrees with that i take very seriously the distinction between phenomenology and philosophy and i think hey philosophy is his logic philosophy of nature and philosophy of spirit and that philosophy is both a logic and a metaphysics it's it's setting out the true nature of thought setting out the true nature of being and it's 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 hegel as it were telling you how it is as he understands it um whereas i don't think the phenomenology is doing that i think the phenomenology is a, an analysis an examination of um what happens when one takes the world to be a certain way and not just what happens contingently but what is the logic of taking the world a certain way you know taking it to be just this or to be made up of things with properties or subject to one's desire to dominate or whatever it happens to be um now you can learn a lot from the phenomenology and obviously you know there are hegel's insights in there but they're phenomenological insights they're not philosophical insights strictly speaking so when i think about hegel's philosophy i i don't make a lot of reference to phenomenology and that's the reason why um but that's not to say that we shouldn't talk about it if you've got you've got things to ask about it because i think it's it's a fantastic book and i just was reading some of the preface before talking to you and it's just one of the most amazing bits of philosophical writing ever it's it's phenomenal absolutely I, I, I love I love it and um, it, it's currently the part of Hegel that I've read the most and I have a question that's kind of basic and I think 
will be something that you can kind of freely riff off of for a little bit. But I don't want to posit that question just yet because from a from, from a facilitator standpoint, I want to just do a check. Or were we going until eight thirty your time? Is that or was it nine? I'm not, I, I just I because. Oh, well, we didn't agree. I mean, I would say if it's all right with you, um, if we could stop at nine, I mean, I'm happy yeah. if, if you dry, if we dry up, we can stop at half past eight. But, but I, I'm, ha I'm willing to go to nine if you want. I mean, basically, you know, the day is done here. It's dark outside. Um, you know, I've done my, uh, you know, I'm not going to go out for a walk, particularly, although the weather's been pretty good. Uh, so I'm happy to talk Hegel. Um, but if we could stop uh, at nine or just before, that would be uh, nice. And I can sort of recover before collapsing in uh, uh, in the heat. Okay, so I think, I think in, in that case, we have, you know, easily another half hour to 40 minutes comfortably, um, yeah. and which, which should probably give everybody enough time to get their questions asked, and that way I won't feel like a selfish hog if I do ask um, a, a load of questions. But, but before doing that, um, I just wanted to do a check it in really quick, because I, I felt like earlier Cade unmiked when he was going to jump in with a question, and I'm not sure if that's true or not, but just wanted to make sure that. Yeah, yeah, I had a, a couple things I was uh, lo looking to ask if I get a, a chance in here based off of what's been like some great listening to the conversation so far. Um, uh, just, like first was just a, a few remarks of like the last like two or three questions uh, on the talking about matter and Hegel's idealism. I, you're absolutely right because there's that one section in the phenomenology in paragraph 577 where he uh, calls matter pure abstraction and as a result the pure essence of thought. Uh, so that nice sort of intermixing between idealism and materialism that he does play out. Yeah, that, that and, exactly. And that's where a certain kind of materialism just becomes an mm -hmm. abstract idealism. That's right, in the 18th century. Uh, and then when you uh, brought up his uh, antipathy towards reducing life to uh, dynamic structures of force. I was thinking about how um, with, with a group of uh, physicists down at the University of Maryland, we'd been reading a collection of essays about Hegel's critiques of Newton and how he much prefers uh, Kepler's work and seems to heavily critique Newton the same way that retroactively you can read him critiquing Nietzsche in uh, how he critiques even the concept of gravity to a certain extent being this sort of uh, a priori positive dynamic structure of force that everything's reduced it down to uh, within his work. Um, and then I had a lot, one question about uh, sort of uh, the space of Hegel in the French Revolution, because uh, it seemed like it was maybe just a side comment from you uh, where it was uh, when the what, Committee for Public Safety came about uh, that that sort of sense of suspicion was seen as maybe somewhat abhorrent towards uh, Hegel's notion of freedom. But then I'm wondering how would you reconcile that with the passage in the phenomenology uh, entitled Absolute Freedom and Terror, which I always took as a bit of a speculative identity where absolute freedom is uh, part and partial with a certain sort of absolute terror. Okay. Um, all right. There's a lot there. Okay. Let's... Um, okay. I let me say a bit about the last one first, and then you'll have to remind me to go back to the Hegel-Newton. Um, um, you're absolutely right. Absolute freedom for Hegel leads to terror. Um, but, of course, what that means is that absolute freedom isn't true concrete freedom. Uh, another term for absolute freedom would be abstract freedom. Um, and what Hegel sees as uh, animating the French Revolution is a particularly abstract concept of the free self, the free I, as a bearer of rights, which understands freedom to be explicitly universal, but also individual. What it cuts out is the moment of particularity. So if you think, you know, classic logical distinction between all, some, and this one, what the revolutionaries have is all, and this individual, and in fact, they think of all, according to Hegel, as all individuals. But they get rid of particular groupings within society. So Hegel thinks that mediating institutions, estates, corporations, and so on, are eliminated by the French Revolution in the name of a radical, abstract freedom of all individuals. Um, and that abstractness 
ultimately he thinks allows for no dissent so that because that freedom is absolute and abstract putting it very simply you're either for it or against it and if you're against it you are an object of suspicion and then i mean you know the story of how hegel um explained he explores this more in the philosophy of history as well actually um how hegel thinks that the very move of as we're setting oneself against universal freedom makes you suspicious it makes you an enemy of the universality of freedom that the revolution was meant to, to promote and so there's no space for any particular differences under as it were the umbrella of freedom we're all free as individuals together and freedom is in the name of all and so if you then want to dissent or disagree from that or take a particular path but you automatically become uh, suspicious. And then, of course, Hegel thinks then there's a, um, a, a cycle whereby uh, the agents of government themselves become uh, objects of suspicion, uh, uh, and, and you know how the rest goes. So, um, and I think that he thinks that the logical conclusion of this is that um, uh, this kind of abstract freedom ultimately culminates in death. And the thing to ask I suppose Hegel is this um, under some accounts of the French Revolution uh, the terror is not intrinsic to the revolution it's in part a response to the revolutionary wars which were initiated by the powers of the ancien regime that were worried about France and started pressuring it from the outside now if that's the case then without that interference from the outside the revolution would have gone on quite happily and there would have been no problem that's not Hegel's view. I mean, he's not denying that that France was involved in 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 wars against the uh, uh, um, uh, the old regime powers, but he thinks there is a dialectical logic within the very nature of abstract freedom that precisely ends up abstracting people from their lives. Um, uh, and the guillotine is, you know, cutting off the head like cutting off the uh, top of a cabbage. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. Abstract freedom and terror are connected, and I think actually. Um, this is speculative, but if we're trying to think about certain forms of terror now and say, you know, why do people do these things? I mean, maybe some of you are too young to remember, um, you know, that this, well, I mean, of course, in America, you didn't go through it in quite the way we did. The, the terrorist activity that was prominent in 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 the late 60s and, and 70s although there were terrorist groups um, uh, uh, working in South America as well but in in Europe with some exceptions a lot of the terrorist groups had particular agenda such that you wouldn't necessarily you, you know you could you could have people standing up for them saying look this is not a terror group this is a liberation group for example you can have a debate about that because you know they've got a concrete goal and there's no, you know there would be something you could do to satisfy ETA or the IRA which would put them out of action but we're in a different world now where it, with some groups it's very difficult to know what on earth we could do to stop them apart from just disappearing off the earth so then you think okay well sure there are there are material reasons for why these things happen there's you know European policy, American policy, blah, 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 blah. But maybe there is a level of abstraction at work. And maybe that's one of the ways of trying to understand how certain acts of terror that we live with are possible in certain very intimate ways. Um, now, that might be only part of an answer, but it's an interesting thing to think about whether abstraction the cutting of oneself off in thought from others doesn't perhaps have material consequences that lead to death. I think that is a Hegelian idea. And I think this is again where idealism and materialism are not at odds with one another. You know, you can, you can, you can, well, think about the life and death struggle. That's a good example. The life and death struggle is a material struggle aiming towards death and what animates it? Identity an abstract conception of identity that understands itself only in terms of trying to kill somebody else 
my abstract identity means you have to die. Now, Hegel is really interested in that structure. Um, so that's what I would guess I would say about the French. And obviously, you know, ab concrete freedom doesn't, uh, 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 doesn't materialize uh, in, uh, itself in that way. As far as Newton's concerned, um, okay. Yes, Hegel praises Kepler for various reasons. And I think the reason he praises Kepler is because he thinks Kepler is more interesting philosophically, not necessarily scientifically, but philosophically, because Hegel thinks that Kepler's three laws um, of, uh, of, of planetary motion, particularly the third law, is understandable, indeed derivable, from the very nature of uh, uh, space time as he understands it. Mind you, the same is true of Galileo's law of fall. So these laws, Galileo's law of fall and Kepler's laws, are the laws that nature gives itself. They are, as it were, the expressions of the autonomy, the autonomy of nature. Um, and he doesn't think Newton's laws have that status. But when it comes to determining the position of a planet in its orbit around the sun, he is quite happy to accept that Newton is a lot more help um, or that Kepler needs to be supplemented by Newton. And in the philosophy of nature, he particularly highlights uh, Newton's idea of perturb gravitational perturbation, the fact that the orbits of the planets are not perfectly elliptical because they perturb one another. That's an insight Newton had that Kepler didn't have. Um, so yes, um, he is critical of, uh, of, of aspects of Newton's theory of gravity, for example. He doesn't think gravity is a force. He thinks that gravity is simply the way in which matter moves with respect to other matter. It's not a force. Um, and, and he doesn't accept Newton's attempt to find a theory of gravitation that explains terrestrial and celestial motion. He sort of likes, if you like, the Aristotelian idea that there is something distinctive about celestial motion that is not captured by the laws that govern terrestrial motion. Um, so, yeah, there are criticisms of Newton, that's right. But, but, but he's not as anti-Newtonian um, as people make out. And one last uh, thing to say in this respect, I don't know you know, if and when you do work through the logic, uh, the longest bits of the logic are on differential calculus. There are two enormous great big remarks that cover sort of, you know, over 100 pages. Um, and Newton is one of the heroes in that story. <laughs> Newton is one of the heroes of that story because Newton's idea of um, magnitudes that have to be understood in their vanishing, not as it were before they vanish or after they vanish, but sort of in their vanishing. Hegel really likes that. He doesn't think that quite gets how we should understand um, the differential coefficient, but it gets it, it, it's it's pretty good. So so in that story, Newton's a hero. So um, whoever it was that asked the question, um, I, I don't know if those um, help in in any way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, the infinitesimal is certainly a key concept historically. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. And, and, and Hegel Hegel is critical of the idea. That, I mean, one of the things he wants to argue is that we shouldn't think of um, the differential coefficient dy dx as the expression of an infinitesimal. Um, uh, that, that's Leibniz. That, so the idea of an infinitely small magnitude, Hegel thinks is incoherent. You know, if it's, if, it's, if it's a magnitude, it can't be infinitely small. And if it's infinitely small, it can't be a magnitude. But what Newton gets is the idea of a kind of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a, a magnitude in its disappearing. That's what he likes. The idea of, of, of it sort of in the process of vanishing. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll. I have, oh, I have two the way. So yeah, I've just been thinking over things in my head here uh, and trying to find a good way to articulate things because I seem to be very not good at that sometimes. <laughs> but uh, uh, at some point in the past hour or so, you said that uh, for Hegel, there is no Yilin Batal. And I was thinking about that with regards to, and I, this was something I've been thinking about before you said that, uh, how the Liz approaches Bergson in his text on Bergson uh, presenting this relationship between the virtual and the actual, both of them being real. But he sort of presents what he calls in A Thousand Plateaus as being this like neo-evolutionism where uh, the virtual becomes actual only by becoming different. Uh, I just was sort of interested to know 
if there was any maybe direct relationship between how that you're aware of uh, between how Deleuze approaches Bergson here and within Hegel, uh, because there does seem to be, at least for me, a lot of relationship with regards to this notion of a virtual or this notion of like virtuality, um, and that both the virtual and the actual are real. Um, and that's a very firm uh, stance that Deleuze takes, but that's just not something that I've in necessarily a direct connection with in my own experience between the Liz's treatment of Bergson and uh, Hegel here. Right, good. Yes. Um, well, I mean, the person you should ask is my colleague Keith Ansel Pearson. You should get him on, and then uh, uh, he knows this stuff a lot better than I do. Um, and and Miguel Begestig be too. I mean, both of them uh, would be, if you want to talk about Deleuze sometime, you should get them both on. Um, right. Um, Maybe I could approach this in a slightly different angle. The, 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 the things that worry me about Deleuze, I guess, are some of the oppositions with which he still seems to be operating. You mentioned the virtual and uh, the actual. And obviously one of the things that Deleuze wants to avoid is what he sees in Kant. So he sees Kant beginning with 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 what he takes to be actual experience and sort of constructing conditions of the possibility which just reflect the very experience so you're just sort of reduplicating um and and, and actually Deleuze's criticism of Kant there is a little bit like hey what Hegel says about formal ground in the logic um where um and actually this is relating back to Newton I mean maybe Newton in inverted commas rather than the real Newton but um what one of the things Hegel is worried about is a form of explanation which takes a particular phenomenon and then explains it through a condition or a ground or a force which is just that very same phenomenon in a different form you just kind of get and so so Deleuze and Hegel share that same concern that 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 in neither case is anything explained there you just get a doubling of what you think you've already got however I suppose in my Hegelian eyes, I would say that doesn't mean to say that you need to have the kind of absolute difference that Deleuze seems to want between the sphere of the virtual and the sphere of the actual. Because the sphere of the virtual is marked by um, differences, processes, which don't seem to manifest themselves as such in the apparently concrete identities that we find within the actual. So identity might be a good one. Um, it seems, as I understand Deleuze, that there is no identity as such within the sphere of the virtual. We've got pure difference. Identity then arises, as it were, in this process whereby the virtual um, actualizes itself. But it arises, as it were, as a kind of secondary effect almost. Now, why does Deleuze insist that the virtual has to lack identity in that way. Um, so, and I think the fact that you get that sharp difference, and obviously there are, there are many more of them, um, I think should make us think that Hegel's unlikely to have a structure that is exactly like that. Um, I think Hegel acknowledges that there is um, something that's not actuality that's also not just possibility and necessity. Okay, so Deleuze is, what do you say, the virtual is not this possibility, okay? I think Hegel will say, yeah, fine, 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 okay, that's good. There is a difference that Hegel draws between the, as if like, the formally possible and the really possible, real possibility. It's an idea that you find in Kant and you find in Leibniz as well, where, as it were, you've got a situation that contains, I'm tempted to say, virtually, the conditions of something that hasn't yet manifested itself yet, those conditions are real and they will and they do actualize themselves. They're not just sort of vague possibilities that could or could not come about. They're real possibilities that actualize themselves. But Hegel thinks those real possibilities don't have a completely different structure from 
the actuality that arises. And they can't be seen as quasi-transcendental conditions. That's another thing that worries me about Deleuze, is that the virtual seems to take the place of, a, of the transcendental, um, in that it's, 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 a, it's, it's a set, it's a ground, it's a set of real conditions, genetic conditions, but which never manifest themselves as such. Um, yeah, I think Hegel would think, yeah, you know, the, 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 the idea of that, I suppose, one of Hegel's thoughts that is perhaps anti Deleuzean is that there's nothing that doesn't manifest itself. Yeah. There is, for Hegel, nothing ultimately hidden. This is why, again, I think he's different from Heidegger. Hegel thinks that, that everything will out itself in some way or another. Um, you know, the inner externalizes itself and it can't but externalize itself and even when it tries to hide itself it will externalize itself in hiding itself you know and of course the psychological um consequences of that are enormous which is why hegel's so interested in the philosophy of spirit in gesture in language in the way that gestures can betray what's going on inside you um so yeah that i mean you know if i knew more about the Deleuze, i could give you more but i would say it's a very good question to ask and and work away at it <laughs> um but i think there are aspects of Deleuze thinking that just are not compatible with hegel because Deleuze draws sharper distinctions than i think hegel would want to draw but i don't think the idea of the virtual as such is completely alien to hegel um i don't know does that give you something to work with maybe yeah, definitely. I know uh, you're, you're by no means a Deleuze scholar. I just uh, wanted to sort of post the question uh, because it's something that I find particularly relevant to my own work. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. I think no, but it's, it's a shame that, that Deleuze, you know, people have commented on this. I mean, Deleuze is so interesting and good and generous about Spinoza. He's, I mean, I don't know the Begson stuff, um, uh, I'm afraid, very well. Um, uh, but, but, you know, my colleague Keith and, and Miguel tell me that that, that's, that that is also very important. Um, Deleuze is interesting on Leibniz, he's interesting on Proust, he's interesting on, 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 um, on all manner of, on Kant. But for some reason, Hegel just, just gets his goat. I mean, he just can't stand what he says. He detests Hegel in some way. And of course, taught by, by Hippolyte. I mean, maybe that was the problem. I don't know. So I don't find Deleuze very illuminating about Hegel himself, I have to say. But... <laughs> uh, go ahead. No, you go. I have <laughs> the elephant in every room in the discussion of phenomenology, of course, is the master-slave dialectic. And we haven't talked about that yet. When I was first, when I was first reading this, what the thing that really struck me viscerally, I guess, was when, when Hegel talks about how the situation of the slave is such as that the slave creates this kind of reservoir of talent and understanding that the master can't. And, and it really struck me that, holy heck, uh, Hegel's talking about himself here. I mean, I can't help but think that Hegel looked upon himself as the slave. You know, he grew up, he lived in a medieval society. He went to this seminary where he had to wear monk's robes. And uh, he had to teach rich people's children. And he felt he was above them. And by God, he was. And uh, he didn't want, when he was writing the phenomenology, this was his ticket out. Now, I know there's these existential things going on there, but, uh, and I don't want to reduce the master-slave dialectic to that. I've been reading uh, also uh, Terry Pinkard's uh, Hegel biography. biography. Yeah. I just love just getting the background information and the history. I mean, it just... I love it. But um, given that caveat, I, I know that there was some personal things going on here with Hegel, but uh, how, how does the master-slave dialectic uh, fit into the Hegelian program? Uh, I know there's conjunctural reasons with 
Kosheb and stuff about how it rose to prominence within a discussion of Hegel. But um, how uh, how do you think is like a, a productive way of dealing with the importance of the master-slave dialectic, not only in the phenomenology, but if it has broader significance in the rest of Hegel's work or not? Right, okay. Um, well, first of all, let me say, um, I don't agree with your characterization. Remember, the, 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 the seminary that Hegel was at was Protestant, so there were no monks. Um, um, and it was, a, you know, it was a theological um, uh, uh, training center. And I'm not sure that Württemberg was completely medieval, um, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and nor do I think, actually, that um, Hegel has any reason to identify himself any more than the, with a slave than any other part of the phenomenology. I mean, there are a lot of different... Um, uh, scenarios that are sketched in the phenomenology, and I don't think uh, that Hegel um, uh, does actually uh, identify himself with any of them particularly. Um, so, okay, um, well, the master-slave dialectic, I'll say a bit about the logic of it in a minute. Um, in There's a, um, a, another version of it in the philosophy of spirit, where Hegel does um, give an, a, an example of what he means by this, and the example uh is is um uh, this is sorry this is the life and death struggle which precedes it the example of life and death struggle which precedes the master slave is that of dueling and so the master slave dialectic is in a sense the relationship the social relationship that comes out of uh, of that kind of sort of combat between uh, 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 individuals um now okay in the phenomenology i think the first so where does it fit well i think it fits in the story of self-consciousness growing up I mean, the way i like to present it is that okay we have the initial account of consciousness of sense certainty perception and understanding then we get self-consciousness and i'm going to skip the stuff for a minute on on desire and recognition because i think that's preliminary I and mean, it's very important but it's preliminary to where the dialectic really picks up again so it picks up again with the life and death struggle and one's got to ask oneself, okay, what generates that struggle? Well, you have two selves who think of themselves as pure selves. Absolutely nothing defines them except being a self. Pure abstraction. They're not defined by their body, by their gender, by their height, by their talent and thing. Or at least that's how they regard themselves. And each wants to show itself to the other as this purely free self. And the way that it does it is by showing that it's not tied to its own life or the life of the other. How do I show I'm not tied to your life? Will I try and kill you? And how do I show that I'm not tied to my life in doing it? Will I risk my life in trying to kill you? Okay. So, so I think first of all, you've got then a relationship between two selves that are, it seems to me, absolutely primitive. This is as primitive and immature a conception of self as it's possible to imagine where I am me and nothing but me, and that's all I am. And Hegel shows that the, 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 the sort of the, the, the material violence that leads to. All right, we move into, I'm not gonna go over the whole passage of it happens, but we move into the, uh, uh, the master-slave dialectic, and things have changed slightly on one side at least. I suppose on both sides, but the master, the Lord, retains something of that conception of self that both protagonists had in the life and death struggle. So the master still thinks of himself as a pure self. Only now he doesn't need to go out and kill the other because the other's already given in. So he gets his satisfaction through the recognition from the slave, through the labor of the slave and through the service of the slave. The slave though, or bondsman, Knecht, um, has given up that sense of pure selfhood given up that sense of independence of pure freedom and acknowledged his or her dependence on things so what you need to remember with the life and death struggle and with the master slave dialectic is there aren't just two elements at issue there are three because the two selves in the life and death struggle each of them understands his freedom in terms of a freedom from givenness, from, from nature, from um, limit. 
and so there's a third there's a space of a third element namely what's given what you you know the, the the bodily characteristics that you just have as a factor of nature each of the selves disavows that and says no that's not no part of me well when we get to the master slave dialectic of course things have changed as one of the selves that says actually i am defined by this who i am is now dependent upon this sphere of givenness of nature of otherness that the master still feels free from so you get a different relationship between self and let's call it the thing that's what that's the word uh, hegel uses and thing here is a kind of placeholder for givenness nature determinacy everything that's not free everything that would bind me and limit me that's packed into the idea of the thing the master still feels free over the thing and free over the slave the slave feels dependent upon the thing and dependent upon the master so there's a difference there now both of them because they're selves are and know themselves to be the power of negativity the power to negate the master has a sense of unalloyed unlimited power to negate and that expresses itself in unrestricted consumption so i can negate whatever's presented to me i can just negate it and then through that passage of negation i affirm who i am i know who i am because i can negate things into me but the slave can't do that the slave relates to something that's given so the slave's power of negation is limited it can only go so far it can only go so far as to alter the form of the thing well the name that hegel gives to that negation that alters the form of the thing and stops short of destroying it is work work just is as he calls it inhibited desire it's 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 that negative desire that can't go all the way so then you obviously you get a distinction between production and work on the one hand and consumption on the other but each is generated by a certain conception a certain self conception the consuming self the master thinks of himself as 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 still free as as unlimited as able to negate whatever's presented to him and the slave on the other hand thinks of himself as limited as restricted um and and yeah you know the rest of the story and i think the rest of the story then is is hegel trying to show that while on the one hand the slave um is obviously subordinate to the master and indeed subordinate to the things on which he's got to work on the other hand he's also got the ability to be creative in a way the master can't be because the slave can work and even though the master puts the slave to work it's the slave who works you know if i order someone to say do this work for me there's nothing i can do about the fact that the other person does the work and they get the satisfaction from doing it that i can't get from having put them to work and i think that's one of the things that hegel thinks so that's one of the things that you know kozhev is trying to get at when he's saying so the future lies with the slave i mean that's not really hegel's story but that's part of what there's a creative dimension to the slave that the master can't have um and then you've got the fear of death uh, which i think is really important and i don't think enough people pay attention to um and the fear of death is a sort of an analog of that uh, sense of pure selfhood that the master has on the side of the slave so the slave has a sense of pure selfhood too only not as power but as fear a fear of being utterly dissolved um and hegel thinks and i've written about this in the book that that if you put that sense of pure self together with labor then the slave can understand his or her labor as an expression not just of a particular skill but of this deeper freedom so i can sure i i can make a chair i can bake a loaf of bread but that doesn't simply make me a carpenter or a baker it makes me someone who can express my freedom in making this chair or in making this bread but in doing a variety of different things um okay so what can we learn from this well i think we can learn that um true freedom doesn't consist in dominance okay what is the what is the, the the dialectic that the master goes through is a simple one effectively that the the mark how does the master know that he's dominant 
because he sees the subservience of the slave. What does the subservience of the slave also show the master? The fact that his own dominance is dependent upon the subservience of the slave. You can't dominate somebody unless you've got someone to dominate, which means your dominance is dependent upon the very person you dominate. So dominance isn't an absolute power. It can't be. Now, that doesn't stop people thinking it is, and it won't stop within history people trying to dominate other people. But there's a logical problem with dominance that Hegel thinks is just unremovable. And that is you can't dominate unless you've got someone there to be dominated. And add to that, however much you put others to work, you are thereby giving them a sense of their own freedom. They may not realize it, but once they come to understand that they're the ones doing the work, then they might come to see that, in fact, they have a greater freedom in that respect, in being creative, than the master does. So I think there's quite a lot can be learned there. Now, one other thing to say, which I think Kajev gets wrong, is the move to Stoicism isn't a simple one. It's not just that, you know, the slave becomes Epictetus the Stoic or whatever, you know, and, and then that's not how it happens. What the Stoic does is pick up and render explicit something in the slave. So Stoicism is a relationship that transcends the master-slave relation. And I think that's another lesson uh, that is kind of, you know, I mean, I'm not saying it's banal, but it's basically obvious for Hegel that true freedom has no place for mastery and slavery. And 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 indeed, that was the position Hegel was committed to. Um, and, and he writes about this explicitly in the philosophy of rights. So I think there's a lot of lessons here. But for me, what's important to remember is that the master-slave relation is just one step on from the most primitive form of selfhood it's possible to imagine. It's just grown up a little bit because the master has accepted at least that you've got to let other people live. And so dominating them is better than killing them. Enslaving them at least acknowledges you need them to be there. But there's a hell of a long way to go until, in fact, right to the end of the book, until you get mutual recognition, which Hegel says is absolute spirit. Absolute spirit is mutual recognition. Well, there's no mutual recognition here. So if you think about now going back to the preliminary stuff before the life and death struggle, you know, where he goes through desire, recognition, mutual recognition. So what he's working out there is what true selfhood is phenomenologically. It's desire, it's recognition, it's mutual recognition. But then he looks at um, structures of selfhood which fall short of that. There's no mutual recognition in the life and death struggle. There's no mutual recognition in the master-slave dialectic. There'll be no mutual recognition when you get to the relation between Antigone and Crayon. There's no mutual recognition between King Louis XIV and his courtiers. You don't get mutual recognition until the very end of the section on the, um, the hypocrite and the hard-hearted judge. Just at the transition from morality to religion. That's when you get mutual recognition, albeit in a very bare form. So I guess, yeah, the primitiveness of self, um, the fact that it can express itself in this relationship, the fact that there's a dialectic inherent in dominance, the fact that there is um, creativity, even in certain forms of bondage, the fact that um, there's a long, long way to go <laughs> from that relationship, logically and historically, to genuine mutual recognition. And, um, Ultimately, to get there, consciousness, self-consciousness has got to grow up. It's got to have a more mature, open, responsive conception of itself. It's got to expand its conception of self to include others in a relation of mutual recognition, not try and kill them or put them down or, you know. So, I mean, that by itself doesn't give you a, a, a politics or an ethics, but it gives you quite a lot. <laughs> so that would be, now I don't know what, what the, so that, I didn't make any reference to obviously to Hegel's personality, but does that square with, with what you've got in reading that section? Yeah, yeah no. Just bringing in the, uh, the part where the, uh, the hypocrite and every, everyone kind of unite at the end, that really, really kind of ties up some of the loose ends there. I just remember years ago before I read Hegel, seeing the 
a car commercial where this guy's driving an Acura or something, and he goes, they may never see your fine home in the woods, but they will see your car. And I thought, if this guy is such a, a big deal, who cares what the peasantry thinks of you? I mean, that's not nourishing. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, this is, play, this is quite important in the uh, in the philosophy of right because um, when Hegel's talking about uh, poverty, which he thinks is, um, at least on my reading, it's not endemic to the rational state, but it is endemic to uh, civil society taking on its own. In one of the um, paragraphs on the corporations, he talks about the situation of people who aren't in corporations. Um, and corporation doesn't mean corporation, it's not Google, he doesn't mean that. He means a, a sort of a, an, an association of people, uh, a, a trade association, I suppose. And he says that if you don't have the recognition from others in your trade, what people will do is try and, as it were, show who they are through ostentation, through great displays of wealth. And that will drive productivity. It will lead society as a whole to maximize production. And that's the source of poverty. So he says one of the causes of poverty is people's desire for excess luxury as a way of, as it were, showing who they are to others in the absence of mutual recognition. So this has real material consequences. It's not just a kind of moral thing that Hegel thinks, oh, well, you know, how could you be so base as to think that your life's value is in your car? He thinks it has material economic consequences if people see the source of their value in material extravagance. It will ultimately lead to impover impoverishing other people. So, yeah, and he's very strong about that. I think, I think, so your intuitions were good Hegelian ones. <laughs> well, that, that really clear, and thank you for clarifying the, uh, uh, the dominance of the conceptual over the existential in this. That, that clarifies a lot of things for me. Yeah, I think the existential is there in the fear of death. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You know, it, it doesn't take a, 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 a brilliant reader of Hegel to see in that relationship, and particularly the analysis of, of the slave, directly or indirectly, the source of so much that's going to come later with Kierkegaard and with, with Heidegger and, and the whole interest in being towards death. I'm not saying being towards death in Heidegger and Kierkegaard is exactly the same as Hegel's talking about. But Hegel giving it such prominence that to be free, we have got to relate to our death in some way. Not merely fear it, but be liberated by an openness to it. That has a huge influence in what later comes to be thought of as existentialism, as of course the, the focus on labor does in, in the different sort of Marxist traditions. So, um, and yet, you know what's bizarre is I think, I mean, there are Marxists around who will know this better than I am. I think that there is not a Marx text on the master-slave relation. At least yeah. it's not one I'm aware of. I mean, there are Marx texts on on other parts of the phenomenology and on the philosophy of right and on Hegel generally. But if anyone out there has a Marx text specifically on the master-slave relation, then please send it to me because uh, I would love to read it. I, I believe you're right. Nothing. And actually, I'm probably gonna write it because <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm developing my thesis right now and desire and recognition really tie in, but I feel like something that's 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 missing is like the, 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 the quality and kinds of, of, of labor um, or time and energy that people can put into things and how the division of labor um, outstrips the individuality of, of the laborer, right? So, I, I mean, this you get this from early Marx for sure, just through alienation, but there is a sense in which um, although, although that, you know, that worker, it's, they are in a certain sense getting the satisfaction of finishing that work, um, they are that the work is becoming simplified, right? And and as it as that work becomes simplified, they become more and more replaceable, right? Yeah. To the point where 
you can't make the saddle anymore. You just put the little thing on the saddle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's, uh, and then, you know, zooming out and tying this into the, the author who will be joining us in a few weeks, Peter Frey's, um, the, the, the issue with automation is that you, you simplify work to the point that it can replace the worker. Now you have a, 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 a growing superfluous um, labor, uh, uh, citizenry, right? And, and under capitalism, if you don't have legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis capital, then you're not really worth anything as a human being. Um, so that all ties in, I'm not sure. Um, Although, you know, you should, I mean, I don't know, you're working mainly on Marx, but, but, but um, obviously Hegel talks about this in um, the philosophy of right. And what's interesting is the problems of mechanization he discusses before he talks about poverty. The problem of mechanization comes precisely through that division of labor, you're right, and through the, 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 the possibilities for simplifying labor that, and then enable machines to take over. And of course, when we're thinking now about robotics and 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 the you know it, i mean without wanting to get political it seems to me it's not necessarily globalization that's putting people out of work it's it's mechanization it's 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 machines it's it's new technologies that 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 well it depends i mean they put people out of work they can also liberate them perhaps to other things but but for many people they they're not liberated they, they just lose their livelihoods that was a problem back in the 1820s you know samuel crompton's mule i mean this is not a new problem and Hegel was very aware of this, um, but but I don't think he associates it yet with capitalism. Okay. I think, and that will be an interesting question whether whether there's um, because I think from the Marx point of view, you're exactly right. This is part of a package with capitalism. But yeah. but if you look at the sequence in which Hegel discusses things in the philosophy of right, and take that sequence seriously, and sort of ask yourself, well, what is creating this um, process of, of, of greater refinement of needs and the greater simplification and multiplication of needs, which ultimately leads to mechanization. It's not the interest of capital as far as Hegel's concerned. Um, I mean, of course, you know, you can say he's wrong, but it will be an alternative. Um, I mean, what it, the, the, what it raises, I suppose, is the question, is the following question. Even if we abolish capital, as capital and capitalism as a system, would that problem of mechanization go away? And in fact, in an odd way, doesn't Marx actually rely on that? Isn't part of what Marx is aiming for is a point at which so much of this people get freed from this labor because productive power in machines becomes becomes more powerful. So there's in a sense in which actually Marx wants to push that that greater mechanization so that people can be liberated for more aesthetic ways of relating to one another. But anyway, I see that it's coming up to nine o'clock. So if it's all right with you. Yeah. Um, it's great. it's uh, it's been great fun to talk to you all. I'm Thanks. absolutely delighted that you're so enthusiastic about the material, and I wish you all the very best with your various studies. and uh, And I hope this has been a bit of a help to you. It's been good fun. I've enjoyed it. It's been great. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you thank you for joining you us so much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great thank pleasure. You. Okay. Thank bye, you. bye bye. Bye now. I didn't get to ask my question. <laughs> I know. You, you wasted time talking about how you wanted to ask your I, I question. Know. Dave, grow up. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> Next time. Next time. Uh, no, it was, it was, it was, it, it, who knows what he would have done with it anyway. It was just uh, going to be about the implicit and the explicit. Um, the, if truth is the implicit becoming explicit, then, then the question is, uh, this is the dichotomy between new age and scientism today, mm -hmm. an extension of what he's talking about here with mere edification versus uh, it. He doesn't put a word on it, but it seems like a scientism. So it seems like there's the edification versus like the, the science, this sort of scientism, the reductivism. And uh, I just want to see if that really kind of just falls on this implicit versus explicit. Mm -hmm. One's a bias towards the one, whereas the other's a bias towards the other. And to me, it sounds so simplistic just to put it that way. You'd say, yeah, right. Now, he would, have, <laughs> he would, love, that. He would love that. He would have a ton of information. Yeah. Anything you feed him, he can internalize it in the Hegelian sense yeah. and then express it. And so he would have been able to. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was really cool. Well, <laughs> cool. He, we didn't get to the point where he says that 
in an abstract way that the two ways, so this is, I wouldn't, wouldn't be able to really read it aloud because it's so verbose, relation of self-consciousness to its actuality. This is where he's talking about the two ways you got a conceptual framework. It says language and labor are outer expressions in which the individual no longer retains possession of himself, per se. It lets the inner get right outside him and surrenders it to something else. See, it's neutral. Labor surrenders it to something else. So, you know, it's not necessarily saying that you're liberated, but you're also not necessarily constrained because you have the ability to do that. So that's the that abstract way when we talk about labor is you get to surrender yourself to something else. So mm -hmm. creation or is it mass production or is it just mm -hmm. alienation? Right, right. Yeah, right. yeah there's, that, there's that whole question too of like, well, and that, I mean, that master-slave thing doesn't work within capitalism. It, it, you would have to be like Kim Kardashian yeah. or Paris Hilton to be the master, but then you're, you're exterior, you're kind of an accident, you're a sideshow. You're a spectacle. You're a spectacle. Yeah. You're not essential. The actual the capitalist, driver, the actual capitalist is fucking working their ass off too. 80 hours right? a week. They, yeah. they're, not, they're not like a feudal lord who gets to just spend their wealth gratuitously. Like they, they have to reinvest it, they have to stay on top of their game. They have to work seventy-hour weeks as well, and so they're not alienated and from their other. They're, they're, they get to keep more of the gains, yeah, right. and they have more opportunity and access and ownership. But at the end of the day, they're not um, chilling, right. <laughs> reliant on these other people, and they themselves are fundamentally engaged and absorbed in their work worlds wow. too, and they, they they have to be. And, and with so. Hegel, they're also subject to the same laws as everybody, mm -hmm. as the workers. Which, you know, yeah, the, the, the reality may be different, but that at a you know logical level, they're also you know subservient to the mm -hmm. state and instead of being the master. <laughs> it does help me with my. Yeah, he's, I love his enthusiasm. He's, oh. Yeah, what a cool guy. Yeah, that was outstanding. He's he's yeah. one of the few that just really wanted, was like so enthused about it. I mean, this is on his own yeah. time too. Oh yeah. yeah. He's, well, and the thing is, I thought he, you know, opt for this the eight thirty, not the nine. I was like, yes. <laughs> I got like, right well, no, you know, yeah, I'll do it till nine. What time is it now? Anyway? Two for two mm -hmm. o'clock. Yeah, I gotta eat some food now. I gotta, yeah. I, gotta. I have to feed my appetite. All right, so, yeah. yeah, I wanted to extend to start eventually. Buy YouTube. Well,